Ladies and gentlemen, the AHAX TV show is about to start. Ask questions via chat or Twitter. See you in a moment and every first Monday of the month, 8 p.m. CET, 6 p.m. UTC. Thank you for watching the show. Hello, my name is Adam Bean and welcome to the late summer edition of AirHacks TV. So let's start with the meetup.com AirHacks group. So first, thank you for the 56, 566 66 members. And um, so um, as you probably noticed, there are not lots of, of announced events. The reason being is I was just too busy to announce them. But there are lots of conferences in the pipeline which I'm going to announce here. Like, for instance, this one. So um, what's what's the deal with uh, meetup.com? So what usually happens, organizer ask me to participate at a conference. And uh, what I what I usually ask is, can I get, you know, the link to the to the uh, live event, to so the live stream? And sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't get it. But sometimes I get a coupon code. So um, I try, you know, to add a little bit on added value here. And this is easier to maintain it here than on my blog. So, um, so I will announce some uh, upcoming conferences at least this year, five, I would say. Okay, next one is um, the podcast. So two interesting episodes, on, uh, I think even, uh, oh, you have a, a lot more episodes. So um, Oleg uh, Selaev from uh, Gralviem was interesting conversation with him. Then I had a chat with Ludovic Champenois. Um, the origin, uh, actually, one of the Glassfish developers, and now he works on Google App Engine and GVisor uh, at Google. So we had a nice chat with somehow even a deep dive to um, Google Web, uh, Google App Engine, and a little bit of GVisor. So it could be interesting. And um, so the serverless Kubernetes without YAML also interesting is about Payara Cloud and what you can do, or uh, what we talk with Patrick Duditz who also attended the ax.com, by the way, which uh, was actually um, nice. And uh, so what Payara does, we have a Payara server and Payara micros, and the Payara server becomes uh, the Kubernetes operator, and it just uh, starts and stops Payara micros uh, indirectly, li like pods. And the idea here is you could use almost like, you know, serverless Java E, where you can push war to Payara server, and it distributes the load among the nodes. And um, yeah, this was a conversation with Patrick Duditz, and I was just, um, you know, history repeats. I think 10 years ago, um, I created an X-Ray, block statistics, and the idea of X-Ray, so you see 2012, and I'm mentioning Hudson, which is now Jenkins, and it was Glassfish 3, and uh, I even wrote then a book about that, So, and I have no time for the book, but um, I'll, history uh, repeats a little bit, so, and... Um, in um, why I did it, because the traffic on my blog was suspicious and I wanted to see, you know, whether it is like, you know, um, just one article or is it just spread evenly across all articles. So I wrote a hit counter basically and called it that X-Ray. And uh, I had the same problem with the podcast. So I saw more and more downloads and I say, is it like, you know, a spam or is it a legit or what's going on? So I created uh, uh, a little bit more, you know, uh, I instrumented uh, the, um, the environment and now uh, I can count the downloads. And um, what happened is that the, uh, for instance, the serverless Kubernetes episode was uh, downloaded uh, 1,600 times uh, uh, a week. And uh, there was like several thousand, 4,700 downloads per week. And they, they look legit. I have no idea whether it's a lot or not for a podcast. It's a, a, lo a lot less on my blog uh, reads, of course. But still, um, it is it's getting more and more popular, and it looks like it's a valid traffic. No idea how often you know uh, someone listens to the to the episodes, but at least they are downloaded. Okay, uh, this was the you know trivia news. So and now the first question, which I actually forgot to open is about here there was an article simplicity by design and what i noticed that the article is actually very very old it is 2011 and i took a look at the article and um and I took a look i read the article and uh, took a look at the code and this is still up to date what i would use differently of course is just explain you know how the pieces fits together i wouldn't use servlets with 
with no reason. I just did it to show all the technologies. But I wouldn't use private for injection. I mean, why? No one cares about that, right? So I would simplify the code a little bit more. And um, so the, um, and I would be a little bit more careful with JSF, n not because they are not, not working technically. The, I would say, developer or manager acceptance of JSF is a little bit problematic, I would say. Um, I still like them. I like prime faces. So um, I would use them in my pet projects if I would, you know, but I don't like, you know, to, to talk with my clients why, or uh, I, I don't like to justify myself why I'm using JSF uh, to my clients or other developers. You know, the endless discussions are a little bit problematic. The same story like, you know, Swing uh, or um, JavaFX is now great again, but uh, let's say I would use Swing, I also would have to, you know, justify myself why I'm using uh, Swing and not something else. But um, with uh, JSF, great technology if you're building, you know, uh, if, you, if you're no knowing what you are doing. So if you pick, let's say, prime faces components and you s stitch them together, it will work perfectly. If you are a starter, um, be careful because, you know, um, I would say the popularity of JSF decreases. This is, I would say, fair observation. And you can be extremely productive, you know what you're doing, but uh, if you're a starter, you will hit, you know, some problems and uh, some problems, you always hit problems, but if you will hit the problems, you will find less resources than, let's say, with web component, JavaScript or whatever, right? So that that's the pro uh, the the problem. Um, also here, for instance, I, I could absolutely think about having even public fields here and I uh, know um, the yeah, but I mean, this is a little bit extreme. But today I've wrote uh, a DTO or a true DTO because we're not persistent with public uh, public fields and use JSONB to serialize and deserialize the object, which works perfectly. Now, um, this, oh, here, here I'm a little bit more pragmatic. You see, I even learned during the article. So I removed the private. Um, so asynchronous, I would use bulkhead and asynchronous instead of that. Um, this looks exactly the same. So this is great about Java E. Uh, this is ten years old article, and the you know and the code is still to the point. I would say, and even I, this is this is interesting. Uh, ten years ago, I already used the ECB pattern. For me, it was like you know two years ago, and um, so I guess I wrote a book in German in two thousand and six, and uh, in this book I used my own pattern, which was terrible idea. And then I switched to ECB because I had to argue less with uh, with the developers. So um, th this is about simplicity by design. So what I will do, do differently today, not a lot. I will just be more pragmatic, you know, write uh, less patents, just more business code and write a little code as possible. What I uh, thought about the productivity with... Um, with uh, Java microprofile, or what I do differently right now is, and and um, the question is why I'm using microprofile in Jakarta E at all. And uh, recently, actually, I had to do something with JSON, and it was actually impossible to use the entire application server there. So I just needed the library, and I and I said, okay, should I go with Jackson or should I go, you know, with JSON B? And of course, I started with JSON B first because you know the two liner, one single dependency. It is probably a little bit slower than Jackson, not as optimized, but um, it is good enough. So th that's the point. And um, what I what I um, wh what I really like about MicroProfile and uh, and Jakarta E is actually the um, how to call it self constraining myself. Right? This is not like I have to you know to look at all the libraries out there. I get something and uh, I know it is enough usually for most cases and you can just pick it and go with it. So And, and then you are more, more productive and maybe even this thing results in better quality. So this is this is the idea. And this is not only true for Jakarta E and, and MicroProfile. This is like uh, usually if you have something to do and you are constrained with resources or whatever, um, usually there are better outcomes. So this is the uh, general observation. So and so and, and therefore there's a, we, we get another related questions about Hibernate and JPA and um, and what um, what I uh, it's the same story. I, will, I would al always pre prefer JPA over Hibernate. By the way, I performed some uh, code reviews over the summer and there were uh, some projects wanted to move uh, to uh, to Quarkus 
And what they used, they use, for instance, uh, internal jersey dependencies, internal eclipse link dependencies. So it is harder to move. And Project which doesn't know used uh, Java E APIs, they could move quicker. Uh, another observation is complete different uh, project. It was uh, with Payara. They used internal Payara APIs instead of the APIs, and this is. Um, and um, and what happened then, of course, uh, if they migrated, sorry, in Glassfish, they migrated to the newest Payara, and then then they had you know, to 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 um, to change the the internal packages because, as I remember, it, the problem was Jersey. It was no more. I think it was once was Comsun Jersey, and then it moved to Org Org uh, Org Jersey. I think. Okay, so now this was the uh, ancient article, with uh, which still. Somehow, somehow works. So this was the X-ray, and uh, now back to the questions. So, uh, what would you do different today with MicroProfile, Java, and Jakarta? I, I would even be be more pragmatic. Uh, I would even ro write more, uh, even simpler code, and uh, and um, don't spend too much time, you know, thinking about patterns. Just write just simple code. This is what I would do differently, maybe. And yeah. So uh, Michael Rack from from uh, from the chat asked me if I understand we have a problem with namespaces Jakarta in MicroProfile. Does it block, for example, for Quarkus? How to resolve it? Which libraries are problematic? Um, no, this was, and we don't have the issue between Jakarta E and MicroProfile, so it should work everywhere. The issue was um, developers used internal Glassfish APIs instead of the official JaxRS Jersey, uh, sorry, Jersey, JaxRS API. And um, this is like JDBC. Instead of using JDBC, um, they would use you know, MySQL drivers directly and uh, skipping the JDBC. And what happened then is the newer Payara version used different Jersey implementation, a newer one, and the Jersey came with different packaging. Also, the JaxRS was the same. So I would say it's the same JaxRS API with different implementations. So if you you know uh, if you if you depend on the implementation, the problem is um, you cannot migrate. So and this happens actually several times on application servers. So. Thank you, Michael. Miko, sorry, not Michael. Um, and this is Mr. J Frog. 1844. If this, so not bad. So you are around. If this is your birth date, I would say uh, more than 100 years, right? So um, and still hacking Java. Now, when you're using microservice along with a REST client, when you're using microservice along with REST client, it should suggest it that each service. Uh, has its own domain object and its own database. Yes, this was the idea of microservices being silos. If that is the case, then how would JPA work with mappings like one to many, many to one, one to one? It wouldn't work at all. That's the point. And uh, we had the same issue in SOA. And I thought that I already addressed this back then. And there was like how to kill a SOA project or what questions to ask first your client. So this was the idea back then. And um, and um, and I thought I addressed the issues here, but I didn't. I wrote uh, about versioning, which is everything is true, of course, uh, a little bit different because there were lots of soap. And the interesting part is I wrote that in 2008. And um, so m whatever problems you, you, you had with SOA back then, we have with microservices right now. So... Um, the, um, the, the, the. So you cannot, if you have two independent database, there are no joins, period. So now, that, now your question should be, okay, fine, what do I do instead? So you will have to talk to the other microservice using JaxRS or REST client. And this could result, of course, in poor performance. And of course, it cannot be consistent, or it is hard to be consistent, because uh, JaxRS does not understand uh, transactions very well. You can implement something like you know, uh, like you could, I would say, emulate transactions with idempotency and uh, REST. 
but it's a lot lot to do. So and um, so what what this would mean is that every microservice has an own database and uh, it 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 duplicates data. This is the business idea. We don't have to time spend the time to, to how to do it, but think about that. If you would be, let's say, in hospital, then in every department uh, in in a hospital, um, the uh, database would keep different, you know, uh, views to the patient patients, different patient data, uh, depending on the on the station or on the department in in a hospital, and and that's this the trick. That you have, you know, different departments, and some data is always the same, like you know, first name and last name. But I don't know, in X-ray you get X-ray data, and in different department you get different department data, and uh, lots of data is duplicated. So microservices are are, um, are about data duplication. By the way, in a project, um, so we, where we talk about architecture recently, what's uh, what's um, what's interesting is if you go towards streaming architectures like you no know, kinesis or kafka or apache pulsar it is reversed that's the interesting part so the queues or topics sorry never queues topics topics are always public and they belong to all microservices and the microservices don't know each other they are just using this is this is like a shared database there's nothing else so i would say kafka or or kinesis architecture is like you know a database shared among all microservices, almost an opposite to microservice architecture, if you think about. And this is how, and and uh, if and and there are absolutely you don't never need you know uh, joints between microservices because they don't know each other. But you could join streams. Absolutely, you can do this. So uh, sad news for you: there are no joints between microservice databases. Um, I've seen suggestions that a main database be used that would push views out to the other database. So you could do this, um, for instance, with Demisium, uh, Debezium, <laughs> Demisium, Debezium. Um, it is like a change data capture, so you can, you know, extract all the all the events to a topic and reconstruct them somewhere else. Or you can use multi-layers views. We also did it in the past, but we didn't call that uh, microservices. So the, the 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 point is. I don't think, you know, monoliths are bad. You can achieve a lot with a monolith. And um, with microservices are solution to, is, is, is a organizational solution. So you have too many developers and they would like to work in parallel. So every team gets a microservice. And then even if they duplicate some things, you know, in the, in the, um, in, from, from the overall point of view, it is still okay to, you know, to, um, to have some little duplication, but move faster. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, and everything becomes complicated. It's not like it, is, it seems too complicated. So I, I don't think Microsoft is about simplicity. They are a little bit of fashion, you know. Everyone now is just almost old news. So now, um, um, but uh, think about this: Why? Which problem will Microsoft solve you? If you know that, and now the next question is: Okay, it solved this problem. Is it worth to solve this problem and you know get rid of joints and all the nice stuff we had in microservices? I think I know um, um, we had in monolith. This is what I wanted. So I think an, 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 a small monolith could be also interesting, right? So um, Dan Heglo asked me, oh, not Heglo, sorry, Hans Georg Glöckler. I have a SPA with a client in vanilla JS, HTML and CSS. Very good. Uh, I need to implement so um, to, to see how good it is. You know, try to launch Angular on a weekend and then compare it to your solution. Then you will see. Uh, just kidding, of course. Uh, um, I need to implement a report engine like Bert in Java. Which report engine can I use with Vanilla JS? Um, Johnny T asked me in the chat. Sorry for the interruption, but you know, uh, chat is chat live. It's very important to know that microservices are not meant to be one table plus rest. Of course, you will usually have some tables in the database, and of course, you can jo use joins. Absolutely. So, uh, at least in my world, um, a microservice was a small monolith. So, I would say we had around 10 tables, and maybe, you know, if you, if you think about BCE's five components, and even if you if you go to EHEX.io and watch my courses about microservices, the microservices 
are very big. So it's never one table, never one. No. It, it could be one if it's no SQL database, but in relational database, never one. So Johnny, absolutely, I'm absolutely with you. And, um, and joins inside of microservices are just great. I'm just saying, if you really would like to separate the databases, then there are no joins. And uh, if you take microservices seriously, there are no, um, no shared jars between the microservices either. So Jan Frederick, uh, Frederick Wilhelm asks, interesting point. This seems to suggest that data replication streaming is essential for many microservice architectures, correct? The problem is I don't call such architectures as microservice architectures anymore. Why not? Because this was the same story like with DAO, data access object. It solved the problem to be independent from various databases, but we only had one, right? So, uh, and this is the same here. So what, uh, what is a microservice? So a microservice, Martin Fowler had a good explanation. So, and Martin is always right. So, now, but where is the definition? Here. So, in short, the microservice architecture style is an approach to developing a single application uh, as a suite of small services, each running on its own process and communicate with lightweight mechanism of the HTTP resource API. So one process is true, but they never communicate with each other in such architecture. They're just, you know, uh, listening to the Kafka topic and uh, and um, sometimes they're reading messages and sometimes they're just uh, enriching the objects and, 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 and pushing the data to a different different stream. So it really depends what you would like to achieve. So I never, I, I never call that uh, a microservice because it become confusing. Maybe you get one microservice, you know, for the user interface, but all other microservices asynchronous edit just listening to topics. Yeah, and how to call it is the is the question, right? Uh, for many microservice architectures, um, in one, I, 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 the correct, <laughs> the correct. Um, Term would be transceiver because it receives and 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 emits and uh, translates. But I mean, no, no one calls such a thing transceiver. So um, I don't know how to call it. So, so a small, for instance, in some of the Quarkus microservices, we don't even have Jax res. So there is absolutely no res endpoint. We don't even have to open an HTTP port. So is it a microservice? I don't know. But very good. So the chat is uh, very vibrant today. So thank you. Now. Here are my questions. Um, yeah, uh, regarding vanilla JS, HTML, and CSS, and very interesting point. I thought about this, and um, what uh, what you can of course use. This is what. Um, it, so if you have to build it from scratch, um, we we had or, or what we had to do is to create a, um, not a reporting system rather than a dashboard, which was more or less fixed. And for that, I always forget uh, 3DS. I think is this data driven uh, data driven 3D JS. Let's see. D3GS. I never get it right. So data driven documents. So take a look at that. This is absolutely vanilla JS component library, and you get crazy charts and diagrams. So it is you know like bird on steroids. And the problem with that is it's not a report engine. It's just like a charting library. But it's great, so you can absolutely use it, and I already use that uh, uh, with web components, so it's absolutely compatible. So now I thought, why there is no reporting engine? And then I got it. We have, of course, one. This is Grafana and Kibana, and they they came with widgets which you can integrate. So um, I think what you could look at is the Elasticsearch Open Distro and Grafana and Kibana, and just use the widgets because building a report engine from scratch is would is hard. Okay, but the question is, you really would like to do this, or how to do that? So what you will need is a backend with JSON, and the JSON backend provides you the data and metadata properly, and then you will build several web components which plug into the big backend, or even better, I would say, uh, you have a Redux store which stores the data from the backend, and then you have different views, different web components, which can uh, show you the data with different aspects. And by the way, this was a spontaneous idea. With the Redux uh, store, 
um, it would be a real-time uh, report engine because if you could even use WebSockets, which are pushing the data from the back end to the front end. So, and then you can interactively, you know, add more components, but there's a lot to do. But yeah, you, you, you are not using Angular, so you have a lot of time, you know, you can spend time building report engine. Um, Benz, oh, Benz Takac, I think. Clean way to use BPM with microservice architectures? Absolutely, um, you can do this because if you think about microservices, you could have, you know, uh, a REST, let's say REST endpoints, and then you have one, the BPM is nothing like, nothing else like, you know, a flexible facet for me, which uh, just calls the other microservices, the, the, and, and, and just, you know, calls this microservice, gets the data, and ideally passes the data to the other microservice, and this is like the orchestrator, right? The problem with that is, it never worked in the past. Um, um, I, I would say that the first attempt was around 2000, where well, lots of rule engines back then, this was the deal. And uh, there was this, this very similar attempt, you know, to combine different Java services. And the problem is, of course, on day two, day one works great. Day two, day two, you will find yourself, you know, writing some glue logic in the BPM engine. And if you have to write the logic in the BPM engine, now is the question, is it really more maintainable, flexible, and debuggable, and faster to implement, productive, than Java? And, and in, in our cases, it was almost always Java. So BPM solves another problem perfectly. Long-running transactions, for instance. For long-running processes, BPM engine is perfect. Okay, now the next next topic. Our next question. Hopefully you are happy. Data-driven documents, done. Next question. Ah, okay. Now, uh, this is the, this question cost, you uh, know, the, the most tabs. So this is like the uh, browser tab award. This is the winner for for this um, late summer Airhex edition. And Mr. Vagelis um, would like to uh, have a what I understood is single sign-on, and um, how to do that from Windows. And he would like to you know to log in once and then uh, to Windows and then reuse the registration or login and go to other services. Mm -hmm. And um, and so the question is, is it possible? Is there any better solution? Is Kerberos SSO held up the way to go? So, and we did it several times. So um, in, in one project, we even used WebLogic and it did it on the, on the server side. Uh, the Kerberos authentication, and then you would just authenticate it. So, but I think it was integrated. I cannot even remember. It was also around maybe 2004 or something like this. And recently, we had to do, do something similar, and this worked a little bit differently. So the the Windows was uh, was not even relevant because all the Windows boxes they also authenticate against Active Directory. And uh, what we did back then is, or what we, we did, um, we just, um, you know, we did together with the Active Directory guys, and they implemented for us OpenID Connect endpoint, and uh, we uh, we uh, authenticated against this endpoint, and then we, we this the session was active, and then you can you know go from whatever you liked, you could communicate from all resources with uh, with the service. And um, I, I was just uh, curious which solutions they are. So there is one one solution, authenticate a user with a single sign-on token in Outlook add-in. For instance, there's Outlook Office. I can push it to the chat. Oh, friend of the show, Anchor, is here. So welcome back. So... Um, the other thing is this one. So I just push it to the chat. So you can read that. There are lots of options. And what I even found, you can use, uh, you can use, um, there's some DLL from Windows where you can get actually the access token, but I don't think whether, whether this is a, I no idea whether this is a really good solution or not. So I will just copy this and you now to get rid of the text.
uh, Benz asked me a great question in a second. And the question is, when to use Redux over state machine? A very good one. The federation, I don't know whether I actually copied it or not. Let's see. So, copied. And uh, so, um, and the way to go is, to, um, and in the cloud, you can use Azure Directory uh, AD for the cloud. This is the, also the SSO. So my, uh, I think, so my feeling is that even Windows always talks to Active Directory service for SSO. So I would go to SSO to do that. Now, if you take a look at this EGB HTTP remoting, so um, this is a really old technology. So you, what you will have to do is to pass the token somehow and then probably use an interceptor to read the token and authenticate yourself. Because in JAXRS it works with JSON Web Token or similar technology almost out of the box with HTTP, HTTP, HTTP remoting. Uh, this is like, uh, I almost forgot about that. This was an interesting story. So uh, in, in Whitefly, you can, you can uh, swap RMI over IOP with basically HTTP. And you can talk from EGB stops with the backends via HTTP, which is wild, but it works. Um, yeah. And um, um, what I guess, you, 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 are, you have to maintain a huge application because, you know, EGB, HTTP, or EJB remoting is really that, um, because that means it's not well maintained by the community. Okay. So I hope, and uh, even Linux, I have, I have, uh, I'm pretty sure that even Linux could use no OpenID Connect to authenticate ac uh, against Active Directory service for sure. Um, from uh, I did it, we did it with Apache, with Quarkus, with Payara, with Whitefly, with WebLogic. And I'm pretty sure never was Open Liberty because yeah, there was no such project. But yeah, should works with all. And and Keyclog is great. You could do something similar on AWS Cognito. It's called Federation. So this is where you are asking you know the backend for tokens. So this is like all such solutions uh, come with um, SSO. Okay, now, Mister. Pablo Ruiz from Barcelona. Great. Um, in a microservice paradigm, I understand that it's convenient to stop using EGBs. This is not true. You can absolutely use EGBs, but if Quarkus doesn't understand EGBs, you don't have to use them. But uh, if you have Payara Whitefly, I always use EGBs because um, it's very convenient. So if you put stateless, you are done, and there are no, no downsides, basically. And uh, and the uh, the microservice or microservice the new runtimes they are not implemented EGBs because they say why to implement EGBs if we get eighty percent of the EGBs with uh, CDI and the older or older yeah the older runtimes Payara Whitefly Open Liberty they already have EGBs and whether they are using them or not they are already there so I would just use EGBs but so if you can use EGBs just use them if you if you can use EJBs, but you know that you have to migrate to Helidon or Quarkus, then don't use EJBs and use CDI right now. So, but the question is, application scoped versus request scoped. So, if you have a migration from EJBs to something else, I would just use request scope because it's more similar. The problem with application scoped is, um, actually, recently as well, another code review, they use application scoped everywhere and hash maps to help state. Not concurrent hash map, hash map. So what it basically means is not basically what it means is that the, on the load the application was not consistent. With request scoped, a hash map wouldn't work because I mean this would work, but every request would get a new hash map, which uh, is just not a global cache, but it wouldn't be at least inconsistent, right? So um, I would go with request scoped and transactional, and the best would be transactional scope, transaction scoped. I think this is the transaction scoped, yes. So um, if they use transactional and request scoped, application scoped is like a slight, a slight performance optimization already, which is not measurable. At least I, I couldn't measure the difference. And um, the, what I'm suspecting is that request scoped could scale a little bit better. Because if you think about this, if you have multiple requests at the same time, let's say 10, then you have 10 instances active at the same time. 
And uh, and if you have one singleton, everything meets in this singleton. So um, so request scoped is has more like you know queue feeling. The problem with request scoped is that the instances are not reused. In EJBs, you have pool, so the instances get reused. So nothing has to be get injected over and over again. And with request scoped, there is the ED overhead. But still, I would use request scoped. Um, Alexei Abashev asked me, is there a way to get native SQL from a, a DML from JPA? I meant not only logging stuff like show SQL, I really need to get it programmatically in runtime for custom monitoring. For custom monitoring, I mean, you can, uh, I think it's called Eclipse Link Session Customizer. So you can get that, and uh, and uh, in Hibernate is also something similar, also with session something, and um, and this DML trick, what you can do is, in persistence XML, there is a setting called something like action, um, not DML action, DDL action, I think, and you can specify what happens on deployment time, and what I did is. I redirected this to a file. So I always had, you know, the create table files and delete table files. And this one was my starting point to use Flower ADB. I'm pretty sure I recorded a YouTube uh, screen, uh, screencast about that. So just search in, in the channel for that. And um, so you can use, I think, session customize and Eclipse link and uh, the Hibernate session, I think, on Hibernate. And uh, this is like uh, Eclipse link. Eclipse, uh, sorry, Eclipse link, JPA standard functionality like DDL action and one is file and the other one is something like table or database. So, and you can specify what happens on deployment time, whether um, JPA should create the tables on the fly or write to a file the DML. And I was always wrote a DML to a file, look at that, uh, tweak this a little bit. And then this was my initial starting point with Flower ADB. You're welcome, Alexei. So you're happy with the answer? Perfect. Um, and again, if you're using Session Customizer from Eclipse Link and you would like to migrate from Eclipse Link to Quarkus, which is Hibernate, you know, you are in trouble. Not in trouble, you have to migrate your customizer. Um, so, and the Entity Manager and Entity Manager Provider, they are actually thread, they are not multi-threaded or oh, sorry not multi they are multi-threaded but are not thread safe so you cannot access entity manager from several threads at the same time um, what uh, the entity manager listens to transactions so if you are request scoped and trans and and transactional you are safe so every thread gets an own entity manager cache so this is how it works Exactly. So um, per transaction, you get an entity manager, and every entity manager holds a cache. So there are never, there's never the situation that two threads can access the same entity manager at the same time. And you are right. If you have request scope, there is no hook on, on startup. In application scope, you can observe the startup event, and the application will start. So I hope your question is answered. Um, okay, the next one is... Uh, what is your approach if you find a project that's using the, the API of Hibernate instead of pure JPA? Do you keep Hibernate or do you try to migrate to JPA? It, of course, depends. So if the project already exists, and uh, I will have to maintain the project, um, and I mean, maintain means if I um, it's a product and I will have to, to maintain it in longer term, I would absolutely migrate it to JPA. If I'm part of the team and the entire team likes Hibernate, I wouldn't migrate, I will use Hibernate. But the question is, you know, why either I would use JPA fully and try to avoid Hibernate or use Hibernate completely and don't use JPA at all because the mix doesn't make sense in my, my opinion, you know. If there's 50-50, then you are restricted by the JPA API and you are very dependent depending on, on Hibernate. For instance, Cascade types I would use from, from JPA because no difference. Uh, types, I think, oh no, I think Hibernate uh, provides more type than JPA. So the question is, you know, for basic types, I will absolutely use JPA. Optimistic lock, I think JPA is enough. And empty interceptor, 
Uh, no idea what it does. I will have to look it up. If there is um, nothing uh, you know uh, available in JPA and you are forced to use Hibernate, just use Hibernate. Um, okay. So um, and I'm a la I'm not lazy. Yeah, lazy actually. <laughs> I always try to use API, and I don't care about the implementation. And this works really well. Um, Today I've wrote a, a backup for a database, a database table, a simple thing. But um, I already mentioned that I had to um, to write JSON, and uh, I thought, okay, I, this is just you know command line utility. It was pure Java. There was, there was nothing, so I could do whatever I liked. And I think, okay, uh, I just just why not use JSON just for fun? But I thought, okay, why? <laughs> and then I went to and use uh, Eclipse JSON uh, JSONB with one dependency and it worked maybe it was not the most performant command line utility but uh, it's exactly the same code i used to know on application servers for years and i could swap it now with other implementation if you like and um if i don't like i could still use um still use uh, jackson so this is i think is a mindset but i do the same in front end as you already noticed um i you know i use web components i try to reduce the dependencies and i forgot by the way a question and the question was, um, state machines, where is the state machine question? And Redux. There was something, a question, when I use state machines and why I use Redux. I would say it's complete different, complete different scenario. A state machine, a uh, state machine would be, uh, actually, in one project, I, I, I used both. Uh, I, I use um, okay. Let's let's go with Redux first. The idea of Redux is is almost like Kafka for the front end. So um, the entire global store is a singleton, and uh, it is it is visible to everyone. And uh, the web component it is actually exactly like Kafka, <laughs> like uh, event driven architectures. So the web components don't know each other. Other they never communicate with each other. They only communicate via via. Redux. So one component communicates with the Redux store, changes the state, and all the other components get updated automatically by the Redux store. And if you're interested in it, search for Adam Bean BCE Design, and you should find uh, a GitHub repository. Very good. Wow, 40, 40 stars already. Uh, and uh, what, what it does, this is like Hello World Redux. So take a look on that. So I try you know, to implement the, the idea here, to capture the idea here. And in one project, this was this was already done. So the way components are communicated with each other. And in one point in time, I had something like, um, you know, if the user does something, then you get this and this options. And after this, you get this and this options. And then the user is done and there is no back button, something like this. So it was like a you know, very strict flow. So, and I thought about using, I think it's called X state. Is it true? Uh, JS X state. This was like, yes. I I wanted to use this first, but then implemented a state machine by myself, which was like twenty. I don't know, maybe fifty lines of JavaScript code, but very simple. So very simple, and um, and I stolen the idea from how it's called. Uh, Jakarta, Jakarta Commons, SC chart or something like this, SCXML. So uh, this is also a very lightweight state machine. Okay, so this was uh, this was. So I would say Redux. You all you need Redux if your application is somehow interactive, and you need uh, state machines if um, but. Yeah, and you need state machine, as I say, if you have flow or you know a kind of a wizard, something like this. It's easier with state machines. Okay, so fun with me. So um, how about writing microservices in GoLang versus Java? Um, this is a, a valid question. Uh, the, my question would be, um, why? Right. So I mean. You could, you know, it's like why we use Golang and not, you know, let's say Ruby, right? So why is it quite around Ruby? So this is like it was a very neutral question, right? Ruby was was supposed to kill Java, and by the way, at this what I, what I 
remember. Now watch this. Adam Bean, Ruby, Kill, Java. I've wrote a blog post, I think. Or Ruby on Rails, right. And I got really heat from the internet. So what they said to me, wait a sec. This is what I remember still. I'm a little bit afraid already. Uh, even the uh, DHH, this was the creator of Ruby, of Rails, said something. So, you could be a journalist with the selective use of bold and ellipsis. Uh, someone, you know, had... What, wait a second. It was a funny comment. You have to read it. Ellip so, uh, they didn't like my way, you know, that they say, okay, uh, Ruby on Rails was supposed to kill Java, now Twitter kills Rails, for instance. And uh, But it was absolutely fashionable, and everyone asked me back then why I'm not using Ruby. And I used a Ruby a little bit, but I didn't like it, and I stick with Java. And when was it? Um, 2011. Uh, 2011 is German. 2011. And um, and there's some question here. Why not use Ruby again? I mean, it was very fashionable. You know, you could use Ruby. Or Python is very fashionable. The truth is, even in Lambda, if you use Java... It becomes if if it is if you invoke let's say the lambda function once a second, in one point of time Java becomes faster than Ruby and the others because uh, we had you know the hotspot. If you hit the the lambda once a day, then you get always a cold start, which uh, you will have to wait two seconds after um, uh, until something happens. So it really depends. But um, Golang, if I would do like to do something different right now than Java, I would probably pick Rust. Because Golang is, uh, is, of course, nice, but, you know, uh, more and more uh, services, Kubernetes services are written in Rust. So then do it with Rust. The question why? No idea. I mean, you could do this. If you have good explanation, do it. And uh, I would say what I like about Java is it is a little bit chatty language, but uh, everyone knows what's going on in Java, right? So this is the great story. Um, I can look at my old, you know, 20 years old code and and it's perfectly readable. I'm not so sure about C and C, C++ like languages, but yeah. But yeah, if you like, just do Golang. It's not like, okay. Now, Michael Rack asked me now another question in chat. I discovered that Tommy91 support Jakarta E91. This is encouraging, but Jakarta only supports JDK 11. We can't use records and others. Um, yeah, it will come. Java 17 is around the corner. I think everyone is wa waiting for Java 17. And um, because Java 16 is not LTS. W uh, why is there support for such old JDKs during Jakarta E breaks backward compatibility? JDKs, you mean old JDKs 11? Because 11, JDK 11 is special. This is the long term release support lts long-term support and the next one with lts is going to be java 17 so that's the explanation um we both use xstate and redux uh ben ben uh, takaj asked me or osas um by the way um a friend of the show listener to, from from the show um asked me um, or ask me, uh, supposed to use Redux, ask me about my opinion to Redux Toolkit. Actually, I'm using Redux Toolkit. And then uh, take a look at the BCE design. This is the, uh, the reducers are simple. And I think it will pay off in more complicated applications, right? Or more complex applications. So, yeah. Now, David Pardo, so great chat. Um, Jakarta MVC project builds on top of Jack's res. How is pe how are people implementing the MVC server side rendering with REST architecture? For instance, replicate the action based old struts with uh, JSPs. Um, service one. The question is how they are implementing this. So the Jakarta MVC is like server side rendering, and uh, the question is why they are. You ask me why they are doing this because I mean. This is more like standardized approach, you know, to JSF, and, and this is very similar to Struts 2. And by the way, Struts 2 is very active, and if, if you like, wait a sec, a huge commercial about 
struts two. Um, how struts two happened and with Lucas Lennart. So if you're interested, the episode number 125, you all have to listen to it. Um, it was fun. And uh, so, um, and the server side rendering becomes more and more fashionable right now in the JavaScript community. So I'm just waiting until you know the Java community we get JSPs back, which I have nothing against JSPs actually. So now we have the oh I closed. Now next question. So, um, is J usable in ARM field? I think what you mean by ARM field is the ARM architecture, what did I ask you? So, by the way, this is Aldo Lush Lushkia, is a friend of the show. He attended all the band uh, shows and um, yeah. Um, there's actually, uh, recently what I did, Graviton on Helidon, I deployed from scratch a Helidon microservice to Graviton CPU, and this is uh, ARM-based CPU from Amazon. I'm also running, uh, running for fun, uh, Java on Raspbies. Works also perfectly, so there's actually nothing to do. What you only have to do, you have to pick uh, Amazon Linux as an AWS and Amazon Coretto, but you cannot buy the CPU. I think the, uh, the, the, the best option, if you would like to, to run something on ARM architectures is to buy an, the M1 chip from Apple. The, um, the, um, this is not this, but um, the newer MacBook Pro from Apple uh, or MacBook Air. Um, they are ARM chips, but there will be no difference for us Java developers. Okay, then, also old friend from the show. I've read about Project Loom. What's your opinion about this project? When will Jakarta E MicroProfile projects profit from it? I think they are already profiting because I don't think um, what Loom was transformed several times from you know uh, the design and and what uh, the, the the recent it is the the recent the, the recent uh, direction is more or less um, more or less uh, being able to start hundreds of threads or thousands of threads with a very low overhead. That's the idea. So. Um, when will Jakarta E and MicroProject profit from it? Uh, Helidon already, uh, um, I think they're already using Loom. At least, um, I don't know whether this is GA. Helidon Loom. You see? Old news. So one year ago, they started already using uh, Loom internally. So um, I don't think you will notice that. What will be happen is that the all the application servers and MicroProfile runtimes will become extremely scalable. On that note, thank you for watching. Listen to your XFM and see you next month and hopefully um, at the AHXIO workshop, or sorry, AHXIO, AHX Live workshops in December about, you know, Pew Java or MicroProfile and Pew Java on, on AWS. So thank you. Bye.